Thanks very much for spending a few minutes with me to learn how Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-test. My name is John Kreschke, and in this talk I'll cover a few highlights from an article in the Journal of Experimental Psychology General. In Bayesian data analysis, the role of data is to reallocate credibility across possibilities. The possibilities are parameter values in a model, such as the mean of a normal distribution. We reallocate credibility to parameter values that are consistent with the data. For example, suppose we have some data that we want to describe with a normal distribution. For purposes of illustration, suppose we entertain four candidate values for the mean of the distribution, namely values of 1, 2, 3, and 4. This graph plots the prior credibilities of the four means as heights of the four blue bars. There are normal distributions superimposed on the four bars to suggest the data distributions corresponding to each mean. In this example, we suppose that the four values of the mean are equally credible a priori, and therefore the bars have equal heights. Then we collect some data, which are denoted by the red histogram here. Notice that the data appear to be most consistent with the second mean, somewhat consistent with the third mean, and only slightly consistent with the other means. Bayes' rule merely provides the mathematically correct reallocation of credibility across the candidate parameter values, as shown in the bottom panel. The result reveals how strongly we should believe in each candidate parameter value given the data. As a complete, realistic example, I'd like to show you robust Bayesian estimation for comparing two groups. Consider two groups from which we obtain metric data. For example, suppose we measure the IQ scores of some people given a smart drug and from some other people given a placebo. The data are shown by the red histograms. Notice that there are outliers in the data. But as far as we know, these outliers are representative of the groups and therefore should not be omitted. The first step in Bayesian estimation is to define a model for describing the data. This figure shows six data points illustrated by black dots. Notice that five of the data points are clustered together, while one data point falls to the far right. The best fitting normal distribution is pulled by that outlying point so that the normal does not describe the data well. By contrast, the best fitting T distribution is nicely peaked over the main cluster of data points with a long tail that accommodates the outlier. Please understand that the T distribution is used here as a description of data, not as a sampling distribution for p-values. The t-distribution has its normality controlled by the parameter nu. Nu ranges from 1 to infinity. When nu is 1, the t-distribution has heavy tails as shown by the dark curve in this figure. As nu approaches infinity, the t-distribution becomes normal. This figure shows the data at the bottom in red histograms. The descriptive model is highlighted in yellow. Each group's data are described as coming from a t-distribution, as suggested by the arrows descending to the data. There are five parameters altogether, namely the means of the two groups, denoted mu1 and mu2, the standard deviations of the two groups, denoted sigma1 and sigma2, and the normality of the data, denoted nu. This model uses a single normality parameter to describe both groups because outliers are usually relatively rare and a more stable estimate of nu can be obtained by letting both groups provide information. Our goal is to estimate the parameter values. We care about the parameter values because the parameter values carry meaning. They describe the tendencies in the data. The second step in Bayesian analysis is to specify the prior credibilities of the possible parameter values. The upper part of the diagram, highlighted in yellow, illustrates the prior distribution. For example, on the far left, 
the prior distribution on sigma 1 is a uniform distribution, spanning a range from an extremely low value L to an extremely high value H. For all the parameters, the prior distributions in this application are non-committal and only mildly informed by the typical scale of the data. This means that the prior probabilities have minimal influence on the posterior probabilities. The third step of Bayesian analysis is collecting the data. There is one fixed data set, shown as red histograms in the bottom of this diagram. The fourth step of Bayesian analysis is computing the posterior distribution over the parameters. There is not time in this brief presentation to fully explain the math and algorithm behind this process, but the idea is simple. The computer uses a method called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC for short, to generate a large number, tens of thousands, of representative credible parameter values. The more values generated, the higher resolution picture we have of the posterior distribution over the parameter values. It's important to understand that these are histograms of parameter values from the posterior distribution. A huge number of combinations of mu1, mu2, sigma1, sigma2, and nu that are jointly credible given the data. These are not data distributions and these are not sampling distributions from a null hypothesis. Let's take a closer look at the posterior distribution for credible values of sigma1 you can see that the distribution is somewhat skewed, with the modal value being 1.95. The dark horizontal bar marks what is called the 95% highest density interval. Points within the HDI have higher credibility, that is, higher probability density, than points outside the HDI. The total probability of points within the HDI is 95%. The 95% HDI is a useful summary of where the most credible values fall. But we can also use the HDI to convert the continuous posterior distribution to a discrete decision. Points outside the HDI may be deemed not credible. When comparing two groups, we usually are interested in the magnitude of differences between groups. The MCMC chain provides a huge sample of credible differences. We compute mu1 minus mu2 and sigma1 minus sigma2 at each of the many credible combinations. The histograms here show the distributions of those credible differences. Here, both differences are credibly non-zero because the 95% HDI clearly excludes a difference of zero. Notice that null hypothesis significance testing would require two tests and corrections for multiple testing, whereas Bayesian estimation provides both results simultaneously. Bayesian estimation also provides a complete distribution of effect size. Effect size is the difference of the means relative to the pooled standard deviation. We see here that the distribution of credible effect sizes is slightly skewed with a modal value of 0 0.622, and it is credibly non-zero insofar as the 95% HDI excludes zero. The computer software for carrying out the Bayesian analysis is free and packaged for easy use. It can be downloaded from the website shown here. Running the analysis involves just four easy commands in the popular programming language called R, as shown here. It's simple enough to use in introductory statistics classes, but also fully appropriate for scientific research. Let's contrast the results of Bayesian estimation with what null hypothesis significance testing says. The data are not normal, so we do resampling, also known as bootstrapping, instead of the standard t-test. Resampling uses no parametric model to describe the data. A resampling test of the difference of means yields p equals 0.116, which is greater than 0.05, so we would not reject the null hypothesis. 
Contrast this with the conclusion from Bayesian estimation, which did reject zero. A resampling test of the difference of standard deviations yields p equals 0 0.072, which is greater than 0 0.05, so we would not reject the null hypothesis. By contrast, Bayesian estimation did reject zero difference. And in NHST, we must apply corrections for conducting multiple tests, which would increase the p-values even more. Moreover, with resampling, there are no confidence intervals on parameter values because there are no parameters. Thus, Bayesian estimation not only provides rich information about the entire distribution of credible parameter values given the data, it is also more sensitive than resampling in this situation. Here's an example with small sample sizes, only eight in each group, as shown in the red histograms in the upper right of this figure. Bayesian estimation shows that a difference of zero is among the 95% most credible differences between means. The classical t-test, on the other hand, says p equals 0.035, which implies that zero should be rejected. In this case, the t-test fails to reveal the true uncertainty in the parameter estimates when simultaneously estimating the normality of the data. By enhancing the decision rule, Bayesian methods can also accept the null value. For example, consider the large samples of data shown by the red histograms. The resulting posterior distribution is very precise. In particular, the posterior distribution on effect size shows that the 95% HDI is very narrow, falling completely between negative 0.1 and positive 0.1. An effect size of 0.1 is conventionally called small, so we might declare that effect sizes in the region are practically equivalent to zero. In general, for any given application, we can define a region of practical equivalence, or rope, when the 95% HDI falls completely within the rope, as it does here, we declare the roped value to be accepted. By contrast, NHST has no way of accepting the null hypothesis. I've shown you a few examples that contrast Bayesian estimation and the classical t-test. It is natural then to ask which should be used, Bayesian or NHST? You may be tempted to ask, which is correct? But we cannot know the truth, that's why we collect data and correctness on simulated data may have little relevance to real-world data. It's better to ask which yields richer inference. The answer is always Bayesian estimation, which provides complete posterior distributions for models appropriate to the data. Many other topics are addressed in the JEP general article, such as Bayesian power analysis, which applies even when the research hypothesis is uncertain, and sequential testing of accumulated data, which can lead to 100% false alarms in NHST, but not in Bayesian estimation, and a discussion of why frequentist confidence intervals are not a viable method. The software and more information are available at the website indicated here. And finally, while I've emphasized how Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-test in the simple case of comparing two groups, Bayesian methods are especially flexible and seamlessly applicable to essentially any descriptive model of data, including all the conventional applications listed here, such as ANOVA, regression, and so on. A complete tutorial is offered in this textbook, which the happy puppies invite you to read. Thank you very much for your attention.